Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Wyatt Claypool Show. Incompetence. Canadian politics is full of it. And that is what I've made the topic of the show today. Talking about all the different shapes and flavors of incompetence that we see throughout our political system here in Canada. And you might be thinking to yourself, couldn't every episode of this show just be on political incompetence considering our political system is full of incompetent people who are always saying and doing stupid things? Yes, but I'm putting a special focus on it today because a few stars have aligned and we have a lot of really funny things to talk about. I usually like to salt other episodes with like polling data or talking about other sort of strategy type things. Today, we're basically just making fun of terrible Canadian politicians, communications teams, as well as how why I hate political consultants so much because they are truly some of the worst people in Canadian politics. But to start off, we're going to be talking about probably the worst MP in Parliament. I know I've named other people as probably the worst MP, but spiritually, we all know it's Mark Gerritsen. I'm about to jump into the tweet he put out yesterday that everyone's making fun of. But before that, I just want to quickly plug my website, WyattClaypool.com. As many of you may know, I was unfairly disqualified out of the Conservative Party nomination in Calgary Signal Hill. I did nothing wrong. They had no excuse to kick me out, but they did it anyways. And I'm at least fighting back across the country by signing up people on my website so I can give nomination recommendations to anyone, no matter what riding you live in, both for municipal elections, provincial elections, federal elections. We need better people all over the country, so I'm trying to expand my network around everywhere so I can try and make sure that you and I can have sort of influence over every race that goes on in this country so we can get better, more conservative MPs in our parliament. But now, without further ado, let's get into one of the dumbest things I've ever seen a politician tweet out in Canadian political history. So Mark Gerritsen yesterday just tweeted this out, this ominous note that says, See you in fall, all Ottawa. And the photo is of him holding up a custom coffee mug that I suppose that he got printed for himself. And it says, boo hoo, get over it, quoting his liberal colleague, Jennifer O'Connell. Yes, he is trying to make this like some big populist rallying point for himself and the liberal party. The worst quote ever said by a liberal MP, probably in the last year of Canadian politics has now been made into some sort of rallying cry for Mark Gerritsen, who took the dumbest quote a colleague of his has ever said. Surprisingly, it wasn't him. But then he took it and turned it into the dumbest social media post we've ever seen. Like, I want to scroll down here a little bit. Look at the ratio that went on here. Obviously, he blocks people from commenting, so no comments. But there are 521 retweets and only 213 likes, yet 362,000 people have seen this post. He should probably delete it. I don't know about you, but I would see, like, if I was on Mark Gerritsen's communications team, if I was one of his office staff members, I would have beat him to death before letting him put out a tweet like this, because that would be less damaging to the party. If anything, his assistant needs to be fired. Because I guarantee the Liberal Party leadership has probably tasked his staff with never letting him pick up a phone and tweet stuff like this. I guess they were out to lunch and Mark Gerritsen had got his phone out of the locked box that they probably put it in and he posted this. But it's not even that this is a terrible tweet because that could be the end of it. Hey, he made a fool of himself, but he is a backbench Liberal MP. But guess what happened right afterwards? It, it's mind boggling. Jennifer O'Connell retweeted it. Why? This was what launched several news articles on how uncaring the liberals are. Jennifer O'Connell, you can see at the top there, she's retweeted this post. This was such a bad post for the liberals. This was something that had National Post, Toronto Star, Tor uh, Toronto Star, like um, Toronto Sun, uh, all the papers wrote on this of just how uncaring that quote was that boo-hoo, get over it, in response to to investigations basically being scuttled and shut down and committees not being able to do their work on foreign interference. Is this really the association that they want to have with that comment? I would be, I would have maybe kicked Jennifer O'Connell out of her nomination if I was the little liberal leadership. Like, obviously, I wouldn't do that. I don't really like the idea of kicking people out of any nomination. It would be ironic if I was actually in favor of that 
considering what happened to me. But goodness, Mark somehow, without with, with only saying, how many words is this? Six words and one photo of himself has made it so that there are as another news cycle of news out there showing how out of touch the liberals are. Like, who could guess how the liberals fell 21 beh points behind the conservatives? It's almost like they show people that they have utter contempt for their standards of ethics. They just think that winning is the only value and they rub it in your face every single day that they're still in government and you can't do anything about it until the fall of 2025. A new election cannot happen soon enough. The rumor I always hear is that, well, one, the liberals might want to keep the government in check or like in, they want to stay in power as long as possible and that they might just wait this thing out until the very end although they did move the, uh, the election back about a week, so they're no longer giving out pensions to people who would barely qualify for them. That was probably a good move on their part because it looked like they were effectively just trying to rob the piggy bank on the way out by just passing out pensions to a lot of these MPs who didn't deserve it by artificially extending the election date. But what they might do is they want to hold the election this year in November. That is actually why there's a lot of conservative nominations taking place and liberal nominations taking place this summer, summer is actually a, a time of year you don't really want to do nominations. There's a lot of fundraisers that go on in the summer and nominations can kind of distract from them. But the reason the liberals want it in November is that they want the Canadian election to coincide with the American presidential election because the liberals have nothing but whining. And so they at least want to be able to make as many Trump comparisons on the way out as possible. But really, that's not going to work. The liberals don't have any real trust with Canadians. So even if for some reason Canadians really hate jo Donald Trump, for some reason Canadians really don't like Donald Trump, it's really just that they consume a lot of liberal American media. The liberal American media hates Donald Trump, so by osmosis Canadians don't like him either. Uh, you know, Trump obviously has a far better track record than Joe Biden does, but whatever. Canadians will see the Canadian election going on, the American election, and they will for some reason feel like a strange need to vote liberal to like reject Trump, even though it's a completely different country and we have completely different issues going on. And obviously Pierre Polyev is going to be better in government than Justin Trudeau, just like Donald Trump would be a better in government than Joe Biden, because anyone would be better than Joe Biden. But that apparently is the liberal strategy, which to tie it into the theme of the show, would be an absolutely incompetent maneuver. I know that the liberals think that's a clever thing to do, but if I was them, I'd hold on to the very end if I was cynical. If I was, you know, if I was doing the ethical thing, I'd call the election as soon as possible. And that might even be better for the liberals in five years, where people at least remember, at least they got out of office early, rather than just forcing us to suffer with them as long as humanly possible. But the no November gambit, would not do very well. But now I want to jump over to the Liberals' ongoing strategy of how to get one over on the Conservatives, undermine their support base, and bring people back into the Liberal fold. And they have not budged an inch on their strategy. Their strategy is still just basically proposing new spending and then saying, ah, oh, the Conservatives would cut it, which I don't know why that's a bad thing. Everyone in this country knows we spend too much and I'm not even saying that as a colloquial type thing, like people I know think we spend too much. No, based on the polling, the vast majority of people, two thirds of the country thinks we spend too much and it needs to go down. Two thirds of the country think immigration is too high. Two thirds of the country don't really think that the dental and pharmacare programs are very good. Yes, you can find anecdotal evidence that some people benefit from them, but you don't spend billions of dollars to generate a few dozen anecdotes to then destroy the pharmaceutical and dental care industries in this country. But this is what the Liberals just posted today on their X account. In just the first half of 2024, Pure Polyus Conservative voted against free prescription contraceptives and national school food program, building nearly 4 million new homes, protecting renters, more $10 a day childcare spaces. They just don't care. Well, oh my goodness, the, the housing one really irks me. Well, they're building nearly 4 million new homes. You can't build 4 million new homes. Leslie Lewis absolutely mocked Sean Frazier in a committee meeting by just asking him, how are you going to build a house every three minutes? Because that's effectively what you would have to do in order to achieve this promise. I think it was like every three minutes and 10 seconds, they have to have built a new home. 
And Sean Frazier basically acted like he's Tinkerbell and Leslin Lewis is being bad for not believing in him enough that he can build statistically impossible amounts of homes considering all the regulatory barriers, the fact that housing does not just spread out of the ground like, you know, I don't even know what really spreads out of the ground that fast, like grass, I guess, that you actually need to take time. There needs to be inspections based on federal and provincial standards, as well as the fact that, again, it's an immigration issue. Immigration obviously needs to fall. The one thing I actually will give the Liberal government credit on is at least they started putting caps on foreign students coming into the country. So when in last year, uh, or pre the previous two years, we had like 40,000 new uh, foreign students coming from India into Canada uh, in like the months of like January and February. These days, it's down to like 20,000, 12,000 because they did institute caps. The one piece, of the, the way I will undermine this credit I'm giving them is just by noting that in India itself, they were even saying that a lot of students were not applying to go to Canada anymore because it became very wall, uh, widely known. The schools that you're signing up for to go to in Canada, most of them are like these scam institute schools that are not actually teaching you anything. And they're just fake business schools set up by immigration lawyers. So that's one of those things where like, D did the liberals do the right thing? Sure, but they kind of did the right thing after they knew the problem was going to take care of itself. So they wanted the credit while also having the baked in excuse that people are also not showing up to Canada as much these days anyways, but they're still not putting tough caps on temporary foreign workers. And our permanent resident numbers are still going up by nearly half a million every single year. But anyways, I want to move on to talking about a liberal video that I think demonstrates that even Justin Trudeau has kind of given up in a little bit of a certain sense. Uh, he was in this, he was in like parliament the other day, going back and forth with Polyev, and the man actually seems like sounds beat down, like he's given up on actually winning the next election. Like you judge for yourself how Justin Trudeau sounds in this clip, but at least to me, it, it, it seems like he doesn't actually really have the spirit to fight anymore, which good, he shouldn't. But uh, this isn't like typical Trudeau. It's like someone needs to give him a nicotine patch. The Conservatives over this past session have stood in this house to stand against dental care for seniors. They've stood in this house to stand against expanding child care investments in spaces. They've stood in this house to stand against the kinds of investments that are helping Canadians uh, with diabetes, uh, Canadians afford birth control. These are the choices that they are making. Now, they're filled with slogans and bumper stickers that don't solve problems but amplify anger while we are focus on supporting Canadians. Canadians can make their choice. Like that was just comatose. Uh, he just has no energy left. And probably he saw these polling numbers. He probably saw like Angus Reid showing the Conservatives rocketing into the mid 20s while the Liberals are literally scraping along the bottom of the barrel at 21%, only slightly higher than the NDP. We have to also remember in Canadian polls, I think that this Angus Reid one, uh, what's the uh, plus minus? I'm not sure if they're giving it, but usually there's a, a margin of error about three or four percent. So when in terms of the Angus Reid polls, they've been in a statistical tie with the NDP for the last three polls that Angus Reid has conducted. And the problem with this, and when you actually looked at this latest poll mapped out, the NDP was winning more seats than the Liberals because the Liberals are like the Conservatives. The Conservatives can get votes in any riding where. There's a lot of ridings where the NDP will get 5% and other ridings where they'll get 35%. So when the NDP vote is around 20%, they can actually win up to like 48 seats or so, 38 seats. They, they'll improve on what they have now. It's not much considering that Jagmeet Singh has put that party in a deep hole and it's only the incompetence of Justin Trudeau that's keeping him in the game. If the liberal leader was slightly good at this, the NDP would be even more relevant than ever. They'd be scraping along 10%, but Justin Trudeau is so corrupt that he makes Jagmeet Singh look good. Although Jagmeet Singh then looks makes Justin Trudeau look good by joining with his government and rubber stamping everything. It's a nightmare. But the liberals with only 21%, the problem is, and this is the problem actually with the PPC, but the PPC is just a small party example of this compared to the Greens, is that the liberal vote more than the than the, the NDP vote is spread across the country. The conservatives are even more so than the rest of them because the conservatives are super spread out all over the country. That's why they need to have big popular vote wins in order to win all the most seats in the 
in the House of Commons. And the PPC is the same, like you can do the same comparison between the Greens and the PPC. The PPC can get more votes than the Greens in the 21 election, but win zero seats. And the Greens can only get like 2.5% of the vote, but they win two seats because they're super concentrated. So that's a bit of a life lesson in politics that if you want to be, if you want to base a party on anything, base it first on regional or very specific demographic interests, and then expand out from there. If you're trying to be everything to everybody, it's going to be a bit of a harder party to get off the ground unless you have a very established brand like the Conservatives or the Liberals. And that's also, of course, why, you know, the Bloc does very well. They only run in Quebec. Ergo, their 8% translates to a lot of seats. Actually, I believe they had 10% in this. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's crazy. If you're having, you're up 2% nationally and those votes are only coming from Quebec, that would be like a clean sweep for the Bloc outside of Montreal, effectively, in Quebec City. Uh, but and actually, the, I believe the Conservatives are even in second these days in Quebec, which is easily actually based on these numbers. But yeah, like the, the Conservatives are in second place in Quebec. And there's a lot of like talk about how, well, Pierre Polyev is going to have to really muscle up in British Columbia and Ontario and the Maritimes to make up for the fact that the Conservatives could lose everything in Quebec. We're like potentially going to triple the seats in Quebec. But uh, as long as hopefully there's not too many incompetent people in the background of the Conservative Party, because, and maybe I'll move on to this now, never overestimate the incompetence of political consultants. Ah, oh, wow, political consultants, the worst people in Canadian politics. As much as you and I hate Justin Trudeau, at least he can say one thing for himself, that he isn't a political consultant and a lobbyist. Because political consultants, their job in Canadian politics half satirical I'm being, is to lose elections. I hate the way consultants run parties. The way that they run campaigns is horrible. There are so many campaign managers across Canada. I've worked with some of them. I've been around some of them in these races, seen how they operate, and I've never been impressed. There's a few people who run strategy firms that I actually think do a good job, but it's the vast minority of people who are actually good at their jobs. The people who are running, and I don't want to name names to not get too personal, the people who are running the UCP campaign in 2023 were utterly incompetent. They did not win the 2023 provincial election for the UCP. They just, the Rachel Notley and the NDP just failed to win. They went in so hard on Daniel Smith that Daniel Smith did a decent job in the debate. And because the NDP had basically been portraying her as an incompetent, crazy person, she looked fantastic going out of that debate. And then Notley, because she assumed that she was going to win, which she probably was going to win, a week before the election was good, was to be held, announces a 33% corporate tax hike. And then she effectively only lost the election by 1,800 votes spread across the ridings that she needed in Calgary. That is absolutely wild. So no, the, the UCP did not put out a smart campaign. I was, I door knocked with a lot of people and these MLAs who could have been more charismatic than, than they had, had been acting were effectively told by HQ, just ID people, just knock on the door, say, hey, I'm X person and I'm running in your area for re-election or I'm running to, you know, be your MLA. Are you going to vote for us or the other guys? Oh, okay. And then they walk away no matter what the answer was. It was horrifying to witness. Like, I'm not the most charismatic man on the planet. I'm weird. I'm a little bit, like, I'm a bit eccentric, I guess you could say. But I actually talk to people at the doors, and people in politics have to realize to win votes, you have to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. And I have a great example of how a party has risk managed itself to death, and that is the Manitoba PC party. You thought I was going to say the BC United party, but I've already talked about them and maybe I'll mention them a little bit later here. But they just lost the by-election in the provincial riding of Tuxedo that Heather Stevenson used to be the representative of. The former premier and uh, like and PC party leader, Heather Stevenson, uh, stepped down from this riding and their new replacement candidate in this riding that has been conservative since it was first created in 1981 they lost to the NDP because the PC party in Manitoba stands for nothing. Like I'll admit, I don't follow PC Paul, like uh, like uh, Ontario, Manitoba provincial politics all that closely. Like no offense to Manitobans. I don't live there. It's not a big province and no big political movements have been generated out of Manitoba for a while. Like Wab Canoe is kind of like the most exciting thing that's happened in Manitoba for a long time. I don't like Wab Canoe, but you could say that he has, 
He has some good populist skills that are admirable to watch, even though I don't like the policies that he wants to pass, although he does want to get rid of the federal carbon tax, so there's a plus for him. But the Manitoba PC party ran a horrible campaign. They ran on nothing. They were fiscal liberals, effectively. And the people were trying to claim, well, they lost the provincial election because their hard stance is in favor of parental rights. No, that's how they recovered a lot of seats that they were going to lose. By taking some socially conservative stances, they actually were able to fight back a little bit in the polls and make it not a, a, not a complete route for them. And it was even some semi-competitive towards the end, although it was a clear victory for the NDP at the end. And the way that you get a stronghold riding like Tuxedo going to the NDP in Manitoba is that you believe that the, the word controversial is the word that you must avoid at all costs. Do you know why Pierre Polyev is, very, is a very good politician? Because he knows how to be controversial in a strategic manner. Yeah, you don't go out in the streets and you swear and you act like a boor and you create controversy by just merely offending people in a raw sense. But if you're controversial, that usually means that you're taking stances, strong stances on issues that people vote on. Controversial issues are the ones that get people voting at the polls. In Manitoba, even some issues that really didn't have big policy implications were what people voted based on. It was the landfill issue with the uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women they, where they were trying to find the bodies of, of two murdered women or one murdered woman. And because the PC government had backed off, we don't want to pursue it, that ended up being a big hit against them that they seemed uncompassionate. And it was a good wedge issue for Wab Canoe and the NDP. I think, and I'm not trying to undermine the seriousness of that situation, obviously that wasn't a big policy issue, and I don't really think that's why the PCs lost. I think that their decision to just say, yeah, we're just not going to look into that was kind of indicative of why they were already losing. The problem with that government is that basically they weren't getting control of the fiscal situation in the province. They weren't particularly that conservative on economic issues. They really weren't that conservative on fiscal issues. They basically only did this knee-jerk pro-parental rights move at the end, which even to real social conservatives, it kind of seemed a bit phony. So I could see still a lot of people not being swayed over by that. But it was a government that you couldn't say anything about. And I know there's probably going to be somebody that's going to bump into me today and say, you did the PC party in Manitoba dirty by not mentioning how great their platform was. Oh, goodness. Platforms? I'm not, I, if I have to, if you're going to tell me like, no, 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 if you get to page 15 on their platform, there's some good stuff in there. No. If I don't even know through just pure osmosis as having focused on the political situation in Canada enough that the Manitoba PC party had an innovative, great new platform, then it wasn't a good platform. If I need to go, go and read it like it's a novel to really get the substance out of it, you failed to put together a good party with a clear vision. You need to take stances on issues that are controversial. Know who's actually doing a great job of this? Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick. He's probably right now in, in Canada, maybe one of two real fiscally conservative premiers. The man is actually getting a hold of the Manitoba budget. The provincial government budget in Manitoba hasn't been balanced in probably a millennia. And he actually has it balanced with a surplus with the promise that in the near future, they're going to be able to cut taxes. That's unheard of in Canadian politics. And although people pull up uh, polls saying, you know, he's the most disliked premier in Canada. Okay, yeah, he doesn't do a lot of handout tactics in order to make himself liked. But the 34%, around 35% of New Brunswickers who like him, really like him because they know what he's doing. He's basically the Ralph Klein of New Brunswick. He's frankly the only Ralph Klein that currently exists in Canada, a guy who takes hard stances and fights for them. He was the maverick who jumped on the parental rights movement early, and he's fought for it tooth and nail and proved that he's a strong ally. And so the people who liked him on those issues are going to show up and vote for him. Mark my words, he'll probably be able to win this new Brunswick election. And if he doesn't win, don't come at me because I didn't say that. No, but like legitimately, I think he should win. That's a guy who understands how politics works. I think he's also following his morals. He's taking stances he truly believes in. But that's also the that's also what being a properly controversial candidate is. It's a man fighting for what he thinks is right. Other people disagree with him, but he's not going to be deterred. That's what made Pierre Polyev very good on the federal level. He believes in doing, you know, I want to cut the carbon tax, defund the CBC, get rid of central bank digital currency, all this stuff, and you weren't going to make him waver. 
when the media came after Polyev and said, you're controversial, you said this and that, or some people say this at you. By holding his ground and going back at them, he gained supporters. The PC party in Manitoba and a lot of other parties across the country, and it sometimes even still happens in the federal party, like in my nomination in Signal Hill, you have people who who like they think that the the ideal in politics is not ruffling any feathers ever because ruffling feathers that sounds bad like no you actually need to win over new voters by taking territory if we're thinking about politics like a military campaign or like a war that's going on not that we should like think of politics as war i think that's a bit aggressive but it's just for this this illustration it's key so many of these consultants lose elections because they engage in what I call blockhouse warfare. Here is our territory, or at the very at the start of the campaign, we do one offensive and we grab the territory. We own more than half the territory in terms of like, let's just pretend that means being ahead in the polls. And we set up blockhouses along the entire, uh, the entire like border of our territory. And we just defend. The problem with being purely defensive is the best you can do in a day is not lose ground. The worst you can do is lose everything. In a real competent campaign, what you need to be doing is defending, attacking, finding out where your opponent's vulnerable, drilling on those issues, connecting with voters, and really talking to people. When you're only thinking about risk management, you can't talk to a voter in a real way where they can detect that you care because you're too scared of saying something that's going to make them not like you. You have to risk not being liked in order to get somebody to truly like you. You don't like your friends because they're guarded and don't want to talk about anything and only sort of want to discuss the weather and golf. No, you like your friends because you can be open. And that's where you kind of have to think of how to do politics. You got to go to a door. I did over 6,000 doors in my riding. You got to approach a door and think of that person as a potential friend because they could be. And you have to talk to them like they're a friend. And you don't guard yourself around friends. You just talk. That's what I would do. I'd sometimes be at someone's door from anywhere from five minutes to an over an hour because I wasn't going to leave until they truly believed that I actually did care about what I was talking about. I'm not doing a drive-by where I'm just basically pressuring you to renew a membership and then run away. That's pathetic. Who cares? I, I door knocked on it. I door knocked every door I came across where other candidates in my riding basically just targeted old party lists and renewed old people without actually really demonstrating why they were a good MP, just basically pretended like, oh, we're from the party and you should renew your membership. And assuming that because they renewed them, that they'd have some loyalty to them. Frankly, that's why one of the candidates pushed to get me out of the race because I was stealing all the support because he's a terrible candidate. I'll just name him right now because why be guarded about it? It's Jeremy Nixon. So if you live in the riding of Calgary Signal Hill, please vote Michael Kim number one on your ballot and all the other candidates just don't vote for uh, Jeremy Nixon anywhere on your ballot. But, you know, this is just one of those things that I've wanted to do a bit of a rant on before, but consultants are the worst. Political insiders who are unelected, but they control party policy, they're overly controlling about candidate behavior because they think being inoffensive is the same thing as being liked. It's not British Columbia United, the BC United Party proved being inoffensive doesn't get you anywhere. It just gets you 11% of the vote because you become the candidate for nobody. And everyone wants either, people want a strong, somebody who believes in something to the nth degree. That if you're a, you know, you're if you're an NDP, they want a strong NDP. If you're a conservative, they want a strong conservative. Nobody, it's, it's not 2006 anymore. People aren't looking for the wishy-washy, PC party guy who's, you know, a tall man with a chiseled jaw and broad shoulders and doesn't he seem professional. People want you to take strong stances on the policy, not just seem like a strong dude. Like, you know, he has strength of character. Well, what does he believe on the issues? I don't know. That that The thing is that after O'Toole betrayed the conservative party base, I could see it coming from a mile away, me and Daniel Boardman and some of the other people at the National Telegraph. But when, when, he, we, when people were betrayed by Aaron O'Toole, that's when people started asking questions about people's policy. Okay, what would you do on this issue? What would you do on that issue? Because when, it, when Aaron O'Toole wasn't investigated enough, gave him enough room to flip on everybody later. But yeah. So, well, that's not it for me today quite yet. I do want to talk a little bit about foreign interference in Canada and just where I think that this story is going, if it's going to affect the next election. But before I do that, I do want to quickly plug, if you really appreciate this show, if you like this show, consider donating to my Gifts and Go legal fund. It's in the description below. 
So try and both sign up for my email list on wyattclaypool.com. It's also in the description below. And if you want to donate anything to the legal fund, it helps me pay the legal bills off that I've been incurring. We have a Chinese billionaire developer suing us for, I think he's suing me for like $900,000. I don't even care because I'm going to win this case in the long run. Uh, he's suing us for defamation and he hasn't even filed any pieces of evidence to prove that we defamed him. We had a guest writer write an article about how he and other Chinese billionaires or funding or millionaires were funding Aaron O'Toole's 2020 campaign. And when we said something about him, our guest writer merely hyperlinked to a long investigative article about him at the Globe and Mail. We pretty much said literally nothing new about him other than his O'Toole donations. And that was enough to sue us. Obviously, he was just assuming that I, at the age of 22 at the time, would have been very weak and just caved to him and said, I'll apologize to you, I'll do whatever you want. And when we didn't do that, he's basically started running away from us in the case because, you know, he, he wasn't expecting the case to go on this long. He assumed that he was going to file something in it against me. I was going to give him a, a sad apology and he was going to be able to go waving around that apology and pretending he's a big man because of it. So if you want to donate, it helps us out. Give, send, go link in the description below. But now let's talk about foreign interference. And first, I want to play this clip from, oddly enough, my favorite opera, The Mikado, when it was recorded by the CBC in 1986, because I think that this does a really good explanation of what Liberal Party MPs are like these days. Mm, but I don't just stop at that. No, 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 no. I go and dine with middle class people on reasonable terms. I dance at cheap suburban parties for a moderate fee. I accept refreshments from any hand. However lowly, I also retail state secrets for a very low figure. Sorry, I like that clip. It, it's actually fully available on uh, YouTube if you just look up the Mikado CBC. Easily the best recording of the entire thing. Uh, actually, that guy, if you if you know him, he's actually from, uh, I think, the Day After Tomorrow, that movie. He's done a lot of stuff. I think he died of, like, throat cancer or some sort of cancer in, like, the early 2010s. Really good guy. Uh, sorry, I, I, I secretly like opera, and now you all know. Uh, but so but the thing with the foreign interference in Canada is this case is very weird. Most scandals that we've had before, I kind of know how it's going to break against one party or the other. I'm not sure if this foreign interference thing is going to break by the next election. I'm not sure how much this even hurts the liberals, oddly enough, simply because it's reporting a lot of the things that Canadians already know about the liberals. Plus, there frankly is a strong probability there is one or two conservative MPs also in like dealing like with some sort of foreign interference connection. It's not because conservatives are bad. It's because in the two main parties, and it's not even because liberals are bad. They are, but it's not because of that. But foreign interference is always going to happen in the most major parties. This is why Jagmeet Singh and Elizabeth May are running around acting holier than thou, because nobody's going to infiltrate the Green Party or like the NDP. They're useless. They don't have any power. But in large parties like the Conservatives and the Liberals, if you have unscrupulous people potentially winning nominations and then becoming MPs who don't really have any shame about, you know, basically being traitors to the country, you have the potential to have a lot of these people willing to work with foreign governments because they're two major parties with a lot of power. So there's a lot of offers coming in for them. And then one or two unscrupulous people start working with a foreign power. You have a problem. Now the liberals, like they know exactly who in their caucus is deal is engaging in foreign interference. They probably knew before the Nisa cop committee had even been like, has it even been held? They easily, it's like Maja Jahari, Han Dong. We know at least two of them, probably Ikra Khalid, uh, uh, if I'm saying that name right, she's like she's literally appeared at uh, rallies where there was like banners behind her saying that Kashmir will be uh, will be Pakistan or something like that. That it, it, she's just obviously extremely pro Pakistani government to the point where she like will attend rallies or events where they're openly stumping against the sovereignty of the country of India. There's a lot of nutters in the Liberal Party, but does this come up before the next election? I don't know. The liberals are using a lot of tactics in order to tie up the ability for someone like Pierre Polyev, even if he saw the Nisikov report, to even talk about it. And if he did talk about it, there could potentially be like legal ramifications, maybe even including jail, because it would be considered some form of soft treason to have exposed this top secret information, even though it shouldn't be secret and Canadians should know if there are like legitimate real dual loyalties 
with our MPs in our parties. And so also, again, the problem too is that any t- if there's a single conservative in that bunch, the problem we have then is that the media will cast this as a 50-50 event. There could be 25 liberals implicated and one backbench conservative that nobody likes. And the media will still make this a, well, they both did it. So what can what does this say about Canadian Canada's political system when obviously it says a lot more about the liberals than it says about some flunky backbencher conservative MP, probably not in the shadow cabinet. So this is where I'm not sure even if the conservatives want this information out, because it would have to be 100% bad for the liberals for it to even benefit the conservatives, where if there's any even inkling that is bad for the conservatives, it could be a big issue. And the one thing I've heard, there might actually be zero conservative MPs named in it. But the one thing I had heard was that they were going to bring up the idea that like the Indian government had interfered in the 22 conservative leadership race to benefit Pure Polyev against Patrick Brown, in which I'm not trying to be rude, but I don't care. I don't like foreign interference. If the Indian government did that, I hope that we would have we'd sanction them if they're trying to rig elections or they're trying to sell memberships on behalf of a political candidate. That's bad. Also, Polyev was going to easily win that nom- that leadership anyways. And Patrick Brown himself was cheating and Patrick Brown himself aligns himself with open pro-terror organizations, Khalistani groups, Muslim Brotherhood groups, you know, Tamil Tigers. He tends to be with some of the most militant, uh, like some like very zealous uh, Islamist and kind of like Sikh separatist types. I don't doubt that he'd work with the IRA if he could. And so this is one of those stories where if the media comes out and they act like now the conservative party leadership campaign is illegitimate, that would be stupid because we can see the memberships that were sold by Polyev. It was like 360,000. I don't think that the Indian government was doing that. If they did anything, it's, you know, shame on them, sanction them. But at the same time, it wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. Uh, Well, so it's one of those issues where is it an issue or is it just like a fake issue? Like even if it happened, did it really happen? Because it was rigging against a guy who's openly like caters to anti-India organizations who himself was cheating in that race. And then we're going to say that the leadership race was potentially negatively affected by a government going after the anti-India guy even though he's already, it, it, it's a it's a big mess. And I don't think that there's really an easy way of going through that. This is where I could see this not being a scandal that the conservatives want to pursue. Because even if something as that stupid came out, the media would pretend, well, they're equally guilty to the liberals, even if the liberals are literally just selling out the government to the tune of billions of dollars to foreign governments and signing secret deals or whatever. But that's just what Canadian politics is like. Everyone's incompetent especially Mark Gerritsen. But that should be it for me today on the Wyatt Claypool Show, everyone. Again, go check out my website, wyattclaypool.com, in the description below, and consider donating to the Give, Send, Go Legal Fund, also linked there in the description below. And I also have a TNT Telegram channel linked in the description below. Basically, everything I'm saying is linked in the description below. I'm repeating myself a lot. But if you want to get all of our videos in order, you can go and sign up on the TNT Telegram channel. And that lets you see all of our posts as we make them in order, rather than having to rely on YouTube or other platforms notifying you when we have something new out. I even sometimes share some of my social media posts there that I think are particularly good. I put out that Mikado clip on Twitter and then posted it as well to the Telegram channel. But again, that should be it for me today, guys. Tune in next time and make any suggestions of things you want me to talk about in new videos in the description, not the description below, the comment section below. Oh, goodness. I'm like addicted to talking about the description. But anyways, that's it for me today, guys. Have a good one.